Welcome to The Hill Update. I'm your host, Dean Allison. By now, you've probably heard of a few theories as to how the COVID-19 virus started. Your social media is probably the source of many of those theories. One in particular has recently made a comeback after a brief mention late last year, and that theory is that the COVID-19 virus originated in a science lab located in Wuhan, China, in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. At first, many people dismissed this theory because it seemed to be strongly supported by the former U.S. president. Fast forward a year, a new president, and the theory is now again being taken seriously. In fact, the current U.S. president, Joe Biden, recently ordered U.S. intelligence agencies to report to him within weeks on how the virus emerged. The president acted because of a report issued by a U.S. governmental lab. This report focused on the origins of the COVID-19 virus. The report concluded that the hypothesis claiming the virus leaked from a Chinese lab in Wuhan is plausible and deserves further investigation. The Wall Street Journal reports that this study was prepared in May 2020 by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California and was drawn on by the State Department when it conducted an inquiry into the pandemic's origins during the final months of the Trump administration. The Wall Street Journal goes on to say that people familiar with the study said that it was prepared by Lawrence Livermore's Z Division, which is its intelligence arm. The report remains a secret. The Wall Street Journal concludes that the assessment is said to have been among the first U.S. government efforts to seriously explore the hypothesis that the virus leaked from the Chinese Wuhan Institute of Virology. In addition to this report, two experts recently asserted that the genetic footprint of COVID-19 has never been seen in natural occurring coronavirus, further bolstering the Wuhan lab theory. Dr. Stephen Quay and Richard Muller based their claims on the genome sequencing pattern of COVID-19 and the large discrepancies in the genetic diversity compared to the other coronaviruses' responses for SARS and MERS. Dr. Stephen Quay is a medical doctor, the chief executive at Altos Therapeutics, and author of the book, Stay Safe, A Physician's Guide to Survive Coronavirus. Richard Mueller is a professor of physics at the University of California, Berkeley, and was previously a senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. This is what Quay and Mueller had to say. The scientific evidence points to the conclusion that the virus was developed in a laboratory. In fact, the entire class of coronaviruses that included COV-2, the CGG-CGG combination, has never been found naturally. That means the common method of viruses picking up new skills called recombination cannot operate there. A virus simply cannot pick up a sequence from another virus if that sequence isn't present in any of the other viruses. They went on to say that experts who say that COVID-19 originated from nature need to explain why the novel coronavirus, when it mutated or recombined, happened to pick its least favorite combination, the double CGG genome. Quay and Muller's conclusion that a lab leak is the more likely cause of COVID-19 stems from the fact that the double CGG genome has never been found in naturally occurring coronavirus and is frequently used in laboratory settings. Leaders around the world are anxiously awaiting the U.S. to report to Biden on this topic. What happens if there's a credible and convincing evidence that COVID originated in the now notorious Wuhan lab? What actions would the world leaders take in that scenario? It's hard to say. So far, there hasn't been much of a discussion about the consequences for China. So for now, we will wait. Joining me on the show this week is Jamie Schmael, who is the Member of Parliament from Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock, who was first elected back in 2015. Prior to being elected, Jamie was a news anchor for, and a news director for Chum Media in the Kawarthas. Jamie has held multiple roles as shadow minister, including for families, children, and social development, and is currently the shadow minister for Crown Indigenous Relations. When we come back from break, we are going to talk to Jamie 
about the relationship between the federal government and our First Nations. We'll see you after break. Welcome back to the Hill Update. Joining me on today's show is Jamie Schmail, who's the MP for Halberton, Kawartha Lakes Brock, and the Shadow Minister for Crown Indigenous Relations. Jamie, thanks for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me. Well, listen, uh, you are you are the Shadow Minister uh, as, as it relates to this topic. You know, we've been hearing a lot about residential schools, a very troubling uh, discovery uh, in, in, in Kamloops area of 215 uh, children. Uh, so let, why don't we take people back a bit? Let's talk about residential schools. Why why did they start? Why did they happen? What was the purpose of them? And then maybe we can uh, talk a bit more about the tragedy that we just uncovered in, in the last couple of weeks. Absolutely. So around the, the 19th century, the, the Canadian government uh, at the time believed that it was responsible for educating and caring for uh, Aboriginal people. Uh, it thought the best chance for their success would be to learn English, adopt Christianity and Canadian customs. Now, uh, ideally, I think what they were thinking at the time was those then uh, traits that were being taught to these uh, children at the residential schools would then be passed along to future generations of, of Indigenous uh, youth and then uh, growing up to be adults. And uh, so at the time, the Canadian government developed a policy called aggressive assimilation and this was then taught to and oftentimes church-run, government-funded uh, industrial schools or then residential schools. Um, so the government thought in, it was easier to, to mold children rather than adults. So that was the focus in, on removing children from their communities, from their parents, and from any influence uh, those parents might have. So this was a coordinated effort with the government. Um, there was uh, uh, agents involved. Um, there was uh, police used as well. So in all, uh, about um, 100, 1,100 students uh, attended about 69 schools across the country. And uh, it hit a peak at about 1931, where about 80 schools were operating in Canada. And uh, that excluded uh, the East Coast, right? There were no residential schools in Newfoundland, Labrador, in Prince Edward Island. Of course, Newfoundland wasn't a, a, a part of the Confederation uh, and nothing in New Brunswick. So it was more uh, kind of from that point westward uh, for the most part. So in total, about 150,000 uh, students, uh, Inuit, Métis, and First Nations were, were involved in the, the residential school uh, legacy. So we, you know, for... And looking back, we can obviously see this was a terrible idea, uh, but at the time they, they thought it w w would be helpful. Let's uh, let's talk a bit about this this gruesome discovery, which I know has troubled the whole nation. It's been a part of your file, part of the things you've been asking about in the House of Commons. You know, how did we end up, and you know, what happened to to end up with you know some of the loss of lives that we we we've seen, we've heard about, and now we're reminded of just uh, just recently in Kamloops. I think no matter who who you speak to and, and the First Nations communities, I don't think anyone was surprised that the remains were found. I think a lot were surprised at the sheer number found, especially in Kamloops, 215, uh, which is horrific beyond words. And initially it was a provincial grant that this organization received to start examining the site around the, the Kamloops residential schools, which was one of the biggest ones in, in Canada at the time. And it started out as a one acre examination and it's now taken up, it, now it's up to three acres and still growing in terms of what they're looking at and what pieces of land they're examining. And, and so this is uh, quite, quite shocking, I think. Um, I, I think it stirred up a lot of uh, feelings and emotions within the First Nations community, because like I said, they've, they've known about this for quite some time and they were to, you know, complaining about it and trying to, to raise awareness about this for, for upwards of 50 years, um, just about the, the, you know, children or their friends going missing and never coming back and, and trying to figure out what happened, but never actually knowing. And so uh, this this is uh, uh, quite uh, tragic and, and unfortunately a, a stain on Canada when you look back on it. 
So we got about 30 seconds left. Just let's talk about some of the, uh, you know, I understand disease was rampant at that time. Just some quick comments of, you know, what, what happened. Sure, as it was explained to me, uh, inside the the schools that were run by the Catholic board, uh, the Catholic church, sorry, they were, were close together. They kept the students close together for the sheer numbers that they were looking out for. Uh, if you look at the, the schools run by churches like the Anglican church, uh, sometimes the numbers weren't as high. So uh, the, the deaths associated with disease and, and, and that sort of thing weren't as high in, in those schools. So that's where you have a bit of the discrepancy. Welcome back to the Hill Update. Joining me on the show today is Jamie Schmail, the MP for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, and the Shadow Minister for Crown Indigenous Relations. Uh, Jamie, once again, thanks for joining me on the show today as we talk about a number of things. You know, government always seems to be in the middle of, of screw-ups. <laughs> you know, there's always, always challenges going on. There's been a, a, a difficult relationship between First Nations and the federal government over the years. You know, we could talk about water advisories and, and lack of clean you know, drinking water, et cetera, et cetera. Would you, let's, let's talk about the challenge the government's had with our First Nations over the years and, and what, what are some of the causes uh, for the poor relationship? Well, I, I think I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, the, the governments of all stripes have, have failed on this issue for 150 uh, plus years. So this has been an ongoing um, uh, concern. And I think, I think when you look at it, it, it's the mechanics that are the problem. It's the fact that government is involved in a lot of cases. And what I mean by that is it's usually, and the approach has been changing, but it has been for the longest time, a Ottawa knows best top-down approach, which we all know doesn't work. It, it, any, any, um, any path forward needs to be indigenous led. It needs to be listening to the elders, the, the traditional values, the, the, uh, the way they do uh, everyday life. It needs to be led by the community. So it has to go bottom up, not top down. So when you mention the water advisories and the fact that we still, and it's shocking to believe that in this day and age, we still have boil water advisories in this country. It's because a lot of times those First Nations communities are fighting with Ottawa to, to get funding or to to get these problems fixed. And, and like you see with municipalities applying for grants and infrastructure, they have to send out the application and they wait and then they wait and then they wait and then they may, may not get the uh, get the, the grant. So that that's a problem. We we have to fix that. It has to be community driven, indigenous led. And, and we we can see a lot of that. But the whole way the structure is built, you know, when you look at the Indian Act, you look at other ways they do business, you know, owning land is is next to impossible. Um, the t issue of taxation for some of these First Nations communities, next to impossible. Uh, so a lot of the things that, that we take for granted, these First Nations communities can't do, and they've been begging for that structural change for, for decades. And I think the only way we're going to fix this is to actually listen to them in a meaningful way and have them join in the conversation and actually lead that charge forward because uh, they're the ones that know best, not the bureaucrats in Ottawa. Well, you know, it's interesting. We looked at even resource development in places like Alberta. When the government started to involve First Nations uh, groups, uh, that's when they became true partners and it made a lot of sense. Uh, you talked about the challenge about applying for grants and stuff. We got about two minutes left. Let's talk about the water. I mean, the water, I say it again, it seems like such a no-brainer. You should be able to fix it. I mean, what is the issue? Is the issue that they lack the training? They lack the skills? I mean, all those things seem to be something that could happen. And, you know, I'm embarrassed uh, that a Canadian government has not been able to figure this out for years. So can you break it down a little bit further for us? On Because you started talking about what are some of the things that make this a challenge? Absolutely. So I, I have in my writing a couple of companies that have approached me on numerous occasions that said we can fix this if given the opportunity. And I'm sure you have too, right? There are many companies that can can make clean water and, and provide that to the communities. So the, the Ottawa interference part is something that is is real. I've heard stories of First Nations communities wanting to expand water and sewer from a municipality uh, right next door, but 
the the city wanted the um, the ministry, the federal ministry, to pay for it. And so did the First Nations community. But the, the government said, no, we don't fund that those sorts of projects, so it's not happening, even though it would bring water and sewer to, to this community that was right next door. And, and so it's the bureaucratic roadblocks. Another issue you have is some of these communities are very remote, so they have to fly in crews to, to install a water system. The problem is they're not training people in many cases on the ground to fix those problems that do pop up with with any uh, major piece of infrastructure, especially a water and sewer system. And and they don't leave parts behind in many cases. So any part that has to be flown in takes a while to get there. And then you have to bring that skilled trade over to to fix it. But we, we should be training the First Nations communities on the ground when those systems are going in. And again, these are things the, the First Nations communities themselves have been asking for for decades. Well, it makes sense. Consultation seems like a no-brainer to me. Okay, when we come back from break, let's talk about uh, the last couple of weeks in the House of Commons. Welcome back to the Hill Update. Joining me on the show today is Jamie Spiel, the MP for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, and the Shadow Minister for Crown Indigenous Relations. Jamie, once again, thanks for being on the show today. You le you represent an amazing uh, part of the country. Uh, I know that you're up north of Peterborough. I think you live in Lindsay, so you're going mm -hmm. into uh, summer months. So you're you're getting into the great uh, great part of the season. And you know what that means? When it gets warmer, at the end of June, that means the House of Commons is going to rise for the summer. And I know there's a bunch of legislation that the Liberals are looking at, and I want you to look into your crystal ball over the next couple of weeks and tell us you know, what we think uh, the Liberals may be trying to finish off or tie up in terms of loose ends, in terms of legislation that is, are on the docks right now. I think one of the most uh, yes, high profile of those bills is Bill C-10, which uh, it tries to regulate uh, internet content providers. So the government wants to in, basically put those content producers, it could be someone on YouTube or TikTok or that kind of thing, uh, which with a large subscriber base into the uh, Radio and Telecommunications Act, basically given the CRTC uh, jurisdiction to to regulate those, uh, those broadcasters. So it, it has the power then to pick winners and losers, demote or promote which artists um, they prefer, the government prefers, which I think is a very dark and dangerous path because it, it's it's the freedom of the, the free market, the individual choosing what content they want to watch or listen to and what content they don't. And, and I think by the government choosing which content they like and then forcing it upon uh, Canadians is, is a very dangerous path. And I think also speaks to the 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 weight they're going to put on artists to openly create content for their audience. And, and, you know, with the free market, if you produce content that nobody wants to watch, people aren't going to watch it. And if you, you, you know, by fluke or otherwise, or planned, you create content that it takes off and becomes a hit and makes you money. Well, well, that's beautiful. And, and uh, that's why the government should not be uh, really forcing uh, these, these content providers into uh kind of uh, the government regulated system because it, it's not the same. So we're, we're in that third reading right now and we'll be, they'll be coming up for a vote. So what's the process for the audience after the third, uh, the third vote that moves off to the Senate? Is there any chance that this could languish in the Senate over the course of the summer? Uh, what are your thoughts around the process piece of, of C-10? Sure. So in the House of Commons, you have first, second and third reading. First reading is the tabling. Second reading is the vote on whether or not to take it to committee, which some amendments sometimes happen. And that's where examination of the bill really gets into depth. Then it comes back to the House for third reading. Reading, If it passes that, it goes to the Senate to basically do the exact same thing. The Senate will be, it's my understanding, rising from uh, for the summer by uh, the end of June. So I don't think it'll get the full uh, examination or at least pass through the, the exact same process as it would if we were continuing to sit. 
there is speculation there could be an election this upcoming fall, which if that happens and the bill has not gone through all three stages in the Senate, it would die on the order paper and basically disappear. And it would be up to the government if uh, the Liberals are reelected to reintroduce that in the same or different form, or if the Conservatives are, re- are elected, uh, not introducing it at all. Well, I, could, I guess that could become an election issue then. We've got about 45 seconds left, uh, Jamie. Anything else? Any, give us some party thoughts on any other legislation that we're going to be looking at before we rise for the summer. Well, we have the uh, budget implementation bill coming up, which, of course, uh, is, uh, I'll quote uh, Don Martin of CTV, it's a super spreader of spending. We have uh, <laughs> billions of dollars outside, borrowed and printed, uh, not accounted for through revenue in the uh, uh, government budget, uh, with a lot of spending that has nothing really to do with COVID. And uh, that, I think that's the, the problem we have with it. If it was truly a budget meant for COVID, we'd see ex- extra spending in places like healthcare, long-term care, that type of thing, but it isn't. We, we see a bunch of pet projects couched in COVID, but really has nothing to do with COVID. And of course, we're supposed to get back to normal, but deficits as far as the eye can see. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us on the Hill Update this week. Always a pleasure. Thank you. So we see that, uh, you know, a lot of times government doesn't always know best. And I think that we, uh, what uh, Jamie Schmiel talked to us about today, that sometimes too much government intervention could not necessarily be a good thing. So we got to remember that uh, governments don't always do things perfectly. It's never a problem to ask questions and realize that if you want to help and get things done, consultation is always a great way to do it. I'm Dean Allison. Thanks for joining me on the Hill Update.